This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to read four passages from his newest work. First, the idea that government's mission is to make things better is false. Government is best understood as a naturally occurring struggle between the outsiders and the insiders. By definition, insiders always control the government and use it to maintain existing power, status, and wealth relationships and exploit the outsiders. Everybody or everyone who isn't either feeble-minded or a saint wants wealth, power, and status. And the easiest, fastest way to get it usually is to take it away from someone else. Taking wealth away from someone else gives you a clear advantage. He has less, you have more. If you make these transfers law, your opponent is at an even more of a disadvantage. Thus, the popularity of government. This second passage is missing the first sentence, but I think you'll get the point. This corrective mechanism does not operate so well in a government program. Failure is often not noticed, and if it is noticed, there may be little incentive to fix it. In fact, the incentives could face the opposite direction. A failure may bring more or continued financing, whereas a success may make the project self-extinguishing. Most often, however, the government employees need not worry. Programs are rife with vague and immeasurable goals. Many are constructed in such a way that they can never actually succeed. And most are purely BS anyway. This third passage I really love. The pretension of the central planner, government, is that he knows a better future, one that he can design and bring about. The godlike vanity of this assertion is staggering. No one really knows what future is best for humankind. People only know what they want. But one more great passage, and this goes right to the rigging, the absolute rigging of interest rates over the decades. But the feds try to stretch the addiction out as long as possible. Why? Because running a rehab clinic can be a good business, especially if the patients never recover. Patients are never allowed to hit bottom. They never get better. And the quacks keep transferring more and more wealth and power to themselves and their friends. Now, I really don't care about your partisan desire, your partisan interest. If you've got a modicum of intelligence, if you know just a little bit You know those four passages I just read are spot on, 100% truth. And those passages are from a book, Hormageddon, How Too Much of a Good Thing Leads to Disaster. My guest today is Bill Bonner, author, publisher. I hope you enjoy this conversation. As I go through your work, one of the first questions I start to have about you is not your current work. We're going to get to that in detail, but I want to know the start. I want to know the start. I want to know the young man, Bill Bonner, and where this this skepticism came from to then start to understand how the pieces fit together, because there had to have been revelations. There had to have been early experiences that triggered you. Well, yeah. I mean, I think like everybody else, but probably like everybody else, you know, I just kind of went on, on my way for a long time and didn't probably think much differently from anybody else about anything. But I then, uh, when I got out of college, I had a job in Washington. A friend of mine had started this thing he called the National Taxpayers Union. And it was a grassroots organization supported by members who sent in like $15. It was really very small. And very small potatoes. He had maybe a couple thousand members at that time. But he asked me to help him, and I, I wasn't doing anything, so I said, okay, I'll help you. 
And that's where, I guess, it, my, my brain started to work because I saw how, how Washington worked, how it really wasn't at all what we were taught in school. It doesn't work that way. It's an entirely different thing. And Washington is, so uh, now we're seeing it more clearly. And this, and this is, now we're 40 years later. And 40 years later, it's coming into, into focus much more clearly. But back then, it was a total re- revelation to me. And by the way, this was the same time. This was like 1970s and then two. I left in about 1983. A whole thing was going on there, you know, we, we, which I talk about now. And now I see that era as sort of the pivotal era. But anyway, the question is, well, what, what made me think the way I think? And I think that experience was, was probably the turning point where I was in Washington watching people do things. And I remember my first, first kind of revelation when, you know, we were lobbying politicians and there was a senator, and I don't even remember his name, but there was a senator from California and we were talking to him about some issue. We arguing the taxpayer's point of view were saying, you know, it really doesn't, doesn't make sense to spend this money. And after a while, I realized that the person I was talking to was not there. You know, he was a, what, a hollow man. You know, he, uh-huh. he was, he was somebody who looked good. And when he talked, you thought, well, this guy, you know, he's got an education. He sounds pretty reasonable. But after a while, I realized that he was not there. He was not interested. He had no interest at all in it and no information, no, no curiosity. He was there to play a role. And uh, it's probably a role he played all his life. I realized that there's a whole other world there going on in Washington. And people had come there not to do something, but to be something. You know, they came because they wanted to be in the power uh, game. They wanted to, to make a lot of money. They wanted to feel important. They wanted to impress their home, their friends back home. It was all kind of a... A theatrical exercise. <laughs> well, not at all what I had been taught in school. So that opened my eyes, and, and I guess what it, one thing led to another. Oh, well, wow! If that's the way this works, probably the rest of the world works the same way. Which is to say, not the way you think it ought to work, or not the way you thought it worked. At that time, I guess I did become rather cynical, skeptical, and always wondering, well, how does this really work? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. I still own property in Fairfax County, Virginia. In fact, I ran for political office when I was 21 in Fairfax County, Virginia. And I still remember meeting one of the most famous politicians in Fairfax County at the time. And I remember shaking his hand. And it was like, it was a very similar experience to what you described. It was like shaking the hand of a dead fish. I mean, he wasn't, he <laughs> yeah. wasn't there. He, he was, I mean, I was a young guy. I remember he shook my hand. He was looking at his shoes. It was an empty, yeah, ves- yeah, yeah. an empty vessel. But, you know, it's, it's difficult to describe what you're talking about because, you know, every year they come out with the top 10 wealthiest counties in America and usually five to six of them surround DC. But I don't think that resonates. Well, maybe it's starting to resonate, but I don't know if it still resonates as well with people. It's beginning. I'd say it's beginning. And it, I think it begun with, the concern that people have that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and then they will look at see who the rich are, and they say, oh, it's not what I thought at all. It's the people around Washington. Well, how are they getting rich? And then you start to think about the whole thing. But, but you know, you have a long way to go from the 1970s to a, a young man in the 1970s kind of opening his eyes to the fact that it doesn't work the way you think it works to today when it doesn't work even close to where you thought it should work. I mean, it's an entirely different thing. And what has happened during that period, of course, is the government has grown. I say government. If you look at the percentage of the GDP taken by government, it has not grown. And so when I say government has grown, people say, no, that's not true. It's not grown. But what's really happened is that the government is much, much bigger than ever, even though it's not called government. Because now you have all those people around Washington you, some of them used to work in the private sector, and many of them still work in the private sector, but it's the private sector that's been taken over by this thing which people are calling now the deep state. The deep state is much bigger, much deeper, much more profound and far-reaching, because the deep state is into everything. And it, it, no matter what you do, now you work part of your time for the government, and not just to pay taxes, but just to conform to the government regulations. And that is so extensive, so pervasive, 
that you see the government's hand in almost everything. The government is much, much bigger, and not just the government that we elect, not the government that we pay for directly, but the government we pay for indirectly includes almost all of Wall Street, which works as a financier uh, for the government and for the people who maintain the government. It's a much more, it's much different. And so when you go from 1970s to trying to understand to today to still trying to understand, but you see there's a whole world evolved in the meantime. Of course, that's the subject of most of my writing is that the evolution of the of the monetary system, the financial system, the, econo- the economy itself. But all that happened together. And it all happened together for a lot of reasons, and you can't put your finger on one reason or one person and say, there's the guy to blame. But it's all part of a big transition that's taken place, and which always takes place. If you look back through history, you find every government if it can, becomes kind of an empire, and every empire follows more or less the same path where people glom onto it and special interests take advantage of it and the military takes control of it and then it's it's bigger and bigger and more encumbered with more debt and more hangers-on and more zombies, I call them zombies and cronies, People who are just who are taking a little privilege that they can get from this big, huge monster of a government, and then then eventually it collapses because it can't go on. It gets too expensive, too weighty, too too anchored in the past. You know, Bill, what's really interesting about your work too, considering I've just watched basically a day of this Super Tuesday cycle nonsense. You're not a guy, though, in your work. You're taking this to another level. You're not a guy that's spending his time in, 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 in you know, cantankerous uh, partisan debates. That's not the point. And I would love for you to expand upon the title of your most recent work, and I, I think specifically the phrase hormesis. I, I, I think it'd be really great to start to break that apart because there's a, there's a real learning lesson that once you put the politics aside— all of these politicians are trying to get their their power levers, their control of the state. The hormesis is this process where they've no- noticed, I think about a century ago, that you can give to an organism, you give a little teeny bit of poison. I don't know what kind of poison. You give a little teeny bit of something that is poison. It will actually stimulate the organism. The organism will do better. But you give a little bit more and it dies. And that got me to thinking to the, thinking about this whole phenomenon, which you know May West described it as uh, you know uh, too much of a good thing is great, <laughs> too much of a good thing is wonderful. Well, the thing that she had in mind probably you know might be wonderful, but but most things, almost everything else in the world, you give too much of, you get too much of, and it's bad. And the economists have known this for a long time that there's this the point this phenomenon of declining marginal utility where you know you get the first dollar you get you say wow that's great the second dollar that's pretty good and then you go on and on you get a billion dollars and then somebody gives you another dollar and you don't care in fact at some point it becomes a burden it really does become a burden this is expression and you know, a wealth is a burden well you get enough wealth it's such a burden that you have to give it away you have to find something to do with it because it doesn't you know, after you have a, the car that you want, the house that you want, the life that you want, the vacations, the meals, what do you do with money? You don't. You can't. It doesn't change your life one bit. If you're a billionaire, that's, of course, why Facebook, uh, Zuckerberg gave away so much money. And people were amazed that he gave away his fortune. But that fortune was worthless to him. It was worthless. He could not change it, his life one bit using that money. It just it had to pass the point of marginal decline, and when things happen like that, and I, I use an example to, which I think is in an entirely different area in the book. You know, for first, I call the book Hormageddon, and it's a combination of this phenomenon of hormesis with uh, Armageddon, and you know, it's the disaster that you get when you keep giving more and more of this poison to people. Well, back, in, if you ask anybody in America, especially America today, and you say, uh, you know, it's Security. We need more security. And then you go through an airport security line, you know, they're patting down a grandmother who just got out of a wheelchair. I've seen this many times. Patting down, you know, and they, you know, sometimes I will say, snide, <laughs> sarcastic, they say, oh, I guess, well, I guess you can't be too secure. Or, I guess you can't take any chances. 
It's idiotic because everybody knows. Everybody in the whole line, 100 people waiting in line, they all know that it's a waste of time, but they all go through it. But that expression, you know, you just can't be too careful. It's wrong. You can be too careful. You can be much too careful. And I use this example of uh, Germany because after World War I, Germany had been defeated, badly defeated, and then badly treated by the Allies afterwards because the Germans had thought they, they signed an armistice, which is not a surrender. It's just a, a stop. It got turned into something else, they, and eventually they were totally at the mercy of the uh, uh, France and England and America. The Germans, they had to give up part of their country. They had to, to agree to pay uh, these reparations, which were so much that they could never possibly pay them. So they were really, really in bad shape, and they had seen what it's like when you don't have any defenses, because they were defenseless at that point. They had no fuel, no arm, no, no ammunition. They, had no, no, they couldn't do anything. Along came this guy, whom we all know, and everybody refers to Adolf Hitler. He says, we need more security in this country. That was effectively was his message. You know, we need, we need to make Germany great again. And he uh, went, went about, in uh, the way you would expect, rebuilding the defenses of Germany. And everybody at the time, including Americans and including English people who went to Germany in the 30s, said, well, this guy's doing a great job. He is helping to renew the country. The factories are working again. People have jobs again. The economy is humming again. And it all looked great. And so you'd say, well, boy, that sure, sure worked well. But he didn't stop. You know, if a little bit of security was a good thing, a lot of security w would be a lot better. So he kept going and going and going. At the at towards the end of it, and the end of it, of course, was a disaster. But at the end of it, half half of the entire output of Germany was directed to the military, and that was a disaster. I mean, you can't things go very very bad when you overdo it, and that was just one one example that I used. But it's true in everything, and, and now. We are in, we are in an economy which has too much debt, you know. And I, I I keep saying it's too much debt. And people say, well, "How do you know it's too much debt?" Well, well, you know it's too much debt when when it starts falling apart, when people can't pay their debts, and when if you price the debt properly, you know, at a reasonable interest rate, three percent or something, there'd be no way to pay it. And we know these governments like Japan. Japan can never pay its debt. It can never. It's a declining declining population. And the debts are way beyond anything that could ever be managed. And what do they do? They go further into debt. So that's got to be a bad idea. But man, this whole this whole Armageddon, Armageddon idea is just an observation, and it's practically irrefutable that when you get too much of something, by definition, it's too much. And when you get too much, you don't get, you know, getting more doesn't help you. <laughs> what you want is less. I was thinking about a great contemporary example that everyone's facing right now. I still recall my CPA telling me in 1998 when my business was starting out, he said, Mike, just get a couple million in the bank, free and clear, 6% a year interest, you'll be <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, and so now we have an yeah. entire generation that saved money. And here's where it gets really insidious. Of course, we've seen zero interest rate policy. But I would love for you to comment on where we're going now, because it seems like really brave new territory. This is w well beyond too much of a good thing. But we're now into the land of negative interest rates. And, and to me, I, 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 I'm, maybe people think I'm over, overreacting, but a negative interest rate seems sadistic. It's for, for savers that, that have not understood what's been going on, the central planning activity for all these decades. Uh, to, to now throw upon people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even over 100 years of age, to throw upon them the idea that, they're, that, that interest is gone and now, now we're going to take some from you every month, it's criminal. It's terrible. And the whole thing is, is so absurd. You know, you're, when you start to think about it, you know, first your mouth drops open and then you start, your brain starts to hurt because it's, it's very, very hard to understand. I mean, it's just in, in a purely theoretical or metaphysical way, you can't figure out what is a negative interest rate. What is it theoretically? I know what a positive interest rate is, where somebody gives you something and in return you give them, give them, you pay them for lending you something. If they lend you a car, you expect to pay for lend, for the car. If they lend you money, you expect to pay for the money. But now we have something negative interest rates. You lend somebody money. And you pay them to take it. <laughs> and it's, it's so absurd on its face that, 
you know, you're, I'm just stunned sometimes. It, it, it turns on its head the whole way in which the world actually works. And the way the world works was described in the book of Genesis. <laughs> I'd like to refer to this because it takes it back right to the very beginning, to the original sin in the Garden of Eden, and the, Adam and Eve were expelled, and the Lord said, from, from the sweat of your brow shall you earn your bread. He was, and he was saying, in effect, the way it actually works. You've got to work in order to earn something. Money is what you earn. Money is, is a substitute. It's a, it represents wealth. You go out, you, you prune the vineyard, you take care of the grapes, you harvest the grapes, you put them into wine. The wine that you drink in the wintertime is the fruit, it's the result, it's the output of the work that you did in the summer. That's the way the world really works. And money, money is simply a representation of this real wealth. If you take it, you now turn it around and you say, no, I'm going to give you money before you go out in the vineyard. It's something entirely different. It's anti-money. You know, it's negative money. It's something that's not worth anything. It only will be worth something if you go out in the vineyard and eventually you make some, some wine and eventually we can drink the wine. And it turns the whole thing on its head. Now, that's just... I'm just talking about the theoretical issue that it, it can't exist. It's in the it, like like uh, you know it's it's one of those oxymorons, like an honest politician. <laughs> you know, it, it just doesn't exist that way. If, when you start talking about it, you start thinking about it, you realize that it's an impossibility. There's no way because let's say if, if it's true, if it were true that money, you can give somebody money and then you're happy if they give you back some less money later on. It means that your money really had no value. It means that the money was an encumbrance. So that you had to pay somebody to stock it for you, to hold it for you, to use your money. It'd be like if you had a piece of cherry pie and you didn't want to eat it because you knew it was awful. Well, you have to pay somebody else to eat it because you didn't want to leave it sitting around. I mean, it's all absolutely absurd. Now, if if it were true, let's say well, we've you know we've gone through some time warp, through some black holes in space and time, and suddenly money is not worth anything, or it's worth less than nothing according to the negative interest rate idea. So now, what does that mean? I worked all my life to accumulate some money. So I saved up two hundred thousand dollars, and now I discover, as you're talking about the saver, I discover the two hundred thousand dollars is worth less than zero. I mean, I've got to pay somebody to stock this stuff or pay somebody to take it off my hands. It's, uh, that means that all that work that I did, all that time that I spent in the vineyard, what was that worth? How about all those bottles of wine that I made during all my career? Are they worth nothing too? I mean, the whole thing is just so absurd. The social contract is broken. I mean, it's... it's Yeah, the whole thing. The, yeah, exactly. The social contract is broken. The whole idea of an economy of work leading to leading to output, leading to money, leading to investment, leading to further output, and so on, the whole thing falls apart, which, of course, it does fall apart. That's just the theoretical thing. So people say, well, forget the theory. What we're trying to do is drive up demand in these economists. Well, you know, there's some, <laughs> I'm just reading a quote from George Well. There are some ideas so stupid that only an intellectual could believe them. That's true of NERP. You have to be a Ph.D. economist to, to believe that you can actually stimulate an economy by imposing negative interest rates. In fact, the way it wor really works is it's a tax. If you have money, you put it in the bank, and then the bank charges you. It's a, just a tax on your money. So you think, well, how does taxing people's money actually make people better off? Well, of course, it doesn't. You take away people's money, they have less money. And so, well, how does taxing people's money increase consumer demand or increase investment demand or cause people to get those animal spirits that you need to lift up an economy? Well, of course, it doesn't. It does just the opposite. And in fact, although NERP is an entirely new thing, the world has never gone through a sustained period of NERP, but Europe has been in a kind of NERP for a while, and now we're seeing... Just what we'd expect to see, uh, your savings rates are not going down, they're going up, and meaning just what you'd expect. People having some money taken from them now are reacting by saving more money because at the end of the day, they're saving for retirement, they're saving to, for their daughter's weddings, they're saving for all kinds of things. They need the money. 
and taking the money from them through this policy of NERF is absolutely idiotic. It doesn't, doesn't cause them to go out and spend just the opposite. It causes them to close up their wallets, save more money, bunker down, stop spending, all the things that they didn't want them to do. The whole thing is absolutely absurd. One of the reasons this can even exist is the, the false notion that people think that government is there to help. It's there to provide some type of nice service for them. And you point out in your work that it's, it's not about government helping or, or doing something nice for you. This is all about a struggle between the outsiders and the insiders. Why don't you speak to that? There's a very good book out by a guy named Harari called, it's called sometimes The History of Humankind. And what he points out, which I hadn't fully realized before, was that the that myths are very important in the human society. And myths are, he believes, the one thing that separates any capacity for myth. is the one thing that separates the animal kingdom from, from human kingdom. Because people, with their brains, are able to develop a whole mythology that, that holds them together. Without this mythology, and it's called, he uses the word mythology because it's something you can't prove. It's something outside of, outside of physical reality. And you have to start with recognizing that there are different kinds of reality. There's one kind of reality. If you go out in the sun on a bright day and, you know, you're like me, you've got Irish skin, you're going to get burned. That's a reality. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter, you know, what the Republican platform is. It doesn't matter what the terrorists in, uh, in Syria are doing or anything. That, that's, that's a reality reality. <laughs> and then there's another kind of reality where I'm walking down the street and some terrorist comes and shoots me dead. Or, or, or uh, uh, yeah, if a terrorist comes and shoots me dead. Now, that's reality. I have been shot dead. I am, in fact, dead. But... That reality is the reality is composed of other kinds of, of mythology. The myth is that the, that there's some sort of war between, I don't know, radical Muslims and Christians or something or other. I mean, there's a whole mythology. There's no reason for that person to do that except that it's based on some kind of myth. And all wars are based on some kind of myth that somebody thinks that this should be that way or that should be this way or we should own that land or, you know, you should free the slaves or we want an independent country. Those are myths in that they're composed reality. They they create reality because they kill you, but they're not reality in separated from our beliefs. They're, 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 they're part of our beliefs. What happens over time is that you get a, a, a buildup of a structure, structure that makes possible civilized life. And say for in the time of Hammurabi, uh, the Hammurabi Code said very clearly, it said that there were differences between people. There are people who are slaves, and there are inferior people, and then there are superior people, something like that. And there are women and men. And he, and it said that if you kill a slave, you have to pay 200 shekels or something. If you kill a free man, you have to pay 500 shekels. And if you kill a superior man, then you have to pay a thousand shekels. Well, we today, that was the mythology that held together the society. Everybody, I, I, I presume, more or less, everybody kind of went along with that. That's the way it was. And then uh, now we don't believe that. We have a new mythology, which is all men are created equal. So if you kill somebody, you have to pay the same amount. doesn't matter. And both of those things are myths. You know, they create a world. They create a world because we share a myth. Neither one can be proven that men are the same or not the same or anything. And those are just uh, totally myths. But because of those, those beliefs, we're able to hold together a society. The nature of Hormageddon, though, is... This is about bubble creation. This is the, the insiders with power. And this, and this goes to only one end. It, it has a logical conclusion every time. There's a pattern across all different types of domains. And there is a, there's an ending that's very bitter. And it, it, it only comes one way. Our conception of government, as you can see, between Hammurabi and today is very different. But it's all based on a myth both, in both cases. And our myth today was in a myth that evolved over the last couple hundred years. You know, it didn't, it didn't come from nowhere. It evolved. 
And why did it evolve that way? Well, you can have a long discussion about why people believe what they believe, when they believe, but they seem to come to believe what they need to believe when they need to believe it, which is to say they need to fit in, they need to operate, they need to get along with the rest of the world. Well, government is fundamentally an instrument of what I call pre-civilization. You know, in the long sweep of history, man's survival was based on violence. Tribes uh, survived by killing things, really. I mean, they, they had gatherers, certainly, and typically, you know, anthropologists have studied this at great length as best they can because nobody around, nobody was around 50,000 years ago, based upon the tribes that they find still living in a kind of a, you know, Neolithic uh, way, they, 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 they figure that back in the old days, they, they, they had people, they, they gathered, but the real, in order to survive, especially in north of, uh, of the tropics, you needed enough calories, and you could, you could only really get enough calories from animals. So they, the people survived by killing things. They killed animals. But they also killed each other, and it's amazing how much research, how much has been discovered over the last 10, 20 years where they find these bones from 10, 20,000 years ago, and they are bones of humans that have been killed by other humans because they have arrows and stuck in arrowheads stuck in the bones, or they have the heads cut off or something or other. These anthropologists are were puzzled about it, but, but they more and more speculate and more and more understand, I think, that that life was, in the primitive world was very violent, and you had to have a strong leader, you had to have an army, you had to be ready to leap into action to defend your tribe, to defend your your territory, defend your women, uh, and, and that that we are hardwired for that kind of thing. And so, that, so that's the way it happened. If you wanted any kind of wealth, by the way, the way to get it was to take it from somebody else, and you know that, that's still. In primitive tribes, that's what happens. You know, they, they, that kind of works today, too, huh? Well, it does work today. <laughs> I'm really getting to that. But, so this, ha- this, is, this is what we are wired for. There was a big change about 4,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, and still going on. It's not, not from one day to the next, but it's gradual. It's a lot of backsliding and so on. Civilization arose. And civilization required a different way of looking at things. It required myths. It required myths about how you get along with other people because you had to live with other people. You know, it's one thing in the old, in, in before civilization, trading was very, very limited. We think that people went trading all over, but there was really very limited trade. And there was a lot of, and you, you, you met somebody, Margaret Mead, who was the famous anthropologist, that said that in primitive societies, if you were walking through the savannah or the jungle and you met somebody from your own tribe, you would sit down and you would, chew the fat or whatever you would do. If you met somebody from another tribe, you would immediately try to kill him <laughs> because that's the way it works. And, and you see that even in, in chimpanzees. They are chimpan- they've now realized that chimpanzees conduct wars, that they have strategies, they conduct wars, and they intentionally try to exterminate other, tri- other, other groups of chimpanzees. So anyway, so that, that was all the prehistory. But civilization required different rules. And it required that you, when you met somebody, you couldn't try to kill them because you had to get along with them and because you had to live in a big city with uh, lots of people you never met. So it, 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 it was with the rise of civilization that we also find the rise of religions. And the Old Testament speaks to that period, that change in the Old Testament between the chosen people always at war, always killing one another, and God told them to kill everybody. And then the New Testament the, ev- the evolving religion round about a few thousand years ago where all of a sudden Jesus comes along and says, thou shalt not kill. Or the Bible says that. God says thou shalt not kill. And Jesus said, treat everybody as you would want to be treated yourself, which is totally revolutionary. Totally revolutionary. Treating everybody as you would want to be treated is the rule for civilized capitalism. In order to, to conduct business, in order to get along in a city, in order to live with other people and do deals, you have to have a certain level of trust that people will do to you more or less what you would do to them. So you go into a bakery, you buy a piece of, you buy a loaf of bread. You don't know, you don't, you don't know the baker. You don't know what he put in the bread. 
You don't know where it came from. You don't know who grew it. You don't know how it was processed. You don't know what kind of uh, off things might have happened to it. But you trust because you have this, this built up with mythology, and more than a mythology, it's a method of operating or so, in which you, you're, you're pretty sure that it'll be all right. That he, in order to get along with you, is not going to sell you bread that will make you sick. The, all of modern commerce works, or all of civilization works that way, with a lot of backsliding, because there is still government. And government is an instrument of pre-civilization. It's an instrument of brute force where instead of making a deal with somebody, all of modern civilized commerce is based on win-win. You know, I'll give you something, you give me something. You know, it's got to be win-win or nobody would do the deal. That's the way it is. And Donald Trump says, no, I don't want win-win. I want, I want to win-lose. <laughs> I, want, I want to win. But the other guy has to think he wins, too. I mean, everybody, in order to do the deal, everybody's got to think he wins. But in government, in pre-civilized order, it works entirely differently. There is no win-win. It is always win-lose. The government takes, the government conquers. Throughout history, that's the way it, it, it always has been. And when you go back to Europe, you know, in, uh, in the 18th century, they had these people called rentiers. And the rentier was somebody who lived off of land rents, typically land rents. But there were a lot of other forms. You could have a, you could have had a toll booth or a monopoly on salt or a monopoly on tobacco or something or other. But the uh, rentier was an expression of the old pre-civilized way of doing business where his ancestor, probably, you know, in some long forgotten crime, <laughs> they had conquered Europe. Europe was conquered by tribes and the strong man of the tribe set himself up in a, in a castle and around him all the peasants worked away and they paid him rent and then he paid rent to the, to his his superior, and then he paid rent to his superior, a system of, of feudalism or vassalage. But he, but that system is based on this very ancient way of doing things, this pre-civilized way. But that pre-civilized way is government in action. Government is fundamentally an instrument of pre-civilized life where it's win-lose, where you, you win by brute force, you conquer, you insist. You know, as Mao says, the government comes out of the barrel of a gun, and, and that is still true today. But what happened after, in the in the 18th and 19th century, there was the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and all of a sudden it looked like government could be changed. It looked like government could be of, by, and for the people, not by the conquering classes, not by the hereditary rich, the elite, and so on. It looked like government could be something that could arise naturally from the people themselves, and they could decide amongst themselves with free elections how things should work. And that idea, that myth, stuck. That myth is what we is why everybody yesterday was lined up at, at polling stations, and they were there before dawn. They're standing in line before dawn to cast a ballot in an election because they believe the myth. They believe that their vote really does count, that they really do control the government, that they can make a better world by helping to tell the government what it should do. All that is becoming clearer and clearer is a total myth. <laughs> the chances of the chances of them affecting at all the outcome of the political race is about zero. And then the chance, even if their man wins, the chance of him doing what they want him to do is about zero. And then even if he does what they want him to do, the chances of that actually improving the world are less than zero because it doesn't work that way. The whole thing is a compound myth. But our idea, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if our idea had not evolved, our mythology had not evolved so that we believe that we collectively we believe in democracy. We believe that we really do control government. We believe that government is not about brute force. Of course, that's not true. That's what government is. It is about brute force. Finally, at the end of the day, that's what it is, and that's all it is. Because if it were something else, it would be like the Rotarians, or like the church, or like a business, or like every other institution in our lives. We have institutions all over the place, credit card companies, newspaper publishers, bakers, shoemakers, none of them. 
none of them rely on force. One of the things that's really interesting in listening to you right now is in my own, my own mind, I'm thinking there's information, there's wisdom. And so many people, especially with uh, communication advances like the internet in the last 15, 20 years, we're inundated with information. It's information overload. I, I don't know that, you know, you've got a great analogy in Hormageddon about driving your truck across the, the country and, you know, the real differences in the last 30 years and they're not that great. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, the internet's cool. I mean, it's connected us all, but most people don't use it like a vast research library. They use it for just silly information. And as I listen to you, what you're really passing along is wisdom. And it's, I think it's harder and harder for the average person to find the difference or to even understand, to get past just information and to actually get to wisdom. Because these stories that have been presented by the central planners, they're very difficult for the average person to get around and, and actually understand that they are just made up stories. No, you're absolutely right about that. And I was just, the, I was looking at something today because... If you want to try to figure things out, things are complicated. Life is complicated. The world is complicated. You've got to spend time thinking about it. And and now I turn on my computer in the morning, and immediately my thought process ends because there are all these things I've got to read. I've got to read what happened in the primary, what who says what about about whatever, and it's very very hard to keep up with all that stuff. And you know they they make a distinction between the urgent and the important. And well, now we are all assaulted by the urgent, and nobody's got time to sit around and think about anything that's important because we have we race, you know, we get like ten thousand messages a day that we got to uh, got to deal with. I feel like I get about ten thousand emails a day that I've got to deal with, and and there's no time to stop and think. You know, I'm lucky, very lucky, in that I have a career, a job where. I I'm support myself by thinking about these things and writing about these things, but how many people can do that? Almost nobody. Almost nobody. And I guess that 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 makes me feel very special. But but in fact, I don't really know that I'm right either. You know, I'm just thinking of thinking about it and reading and trying to put the pieces together. But I certainly could be wrong. But anyway, I saw a figure today when I was just looking it up here, actually on my little cell phone while we were talking, because it shows how idiotic the whole system is. They did a poll of Americans about how the government works. They don't know how the government works. They don't even know how it's supposed to work. <laughs> you know, they can't, they can't have that revelation when they, in that moment when they say, wait a minute, this doesn't work like I thought it worked, because they never even thought about how it worked. You know, they, here, here it is, right here. The National Constitution Center did a poll. They found that 41% of Americans are not aware that there are three branches of government. 62% of them can't name them, and 33% can't name a single one of them. <laughs> you know, you can't be shocked that the government doesn't work the way you thought it did when you had no idea how, how it should. One of the things that I think is really fascinating about the, the this notion of information and wisdom is economists, uh, specifically a lot of the, the data that comes from economists, their stats, etc. And you've got a great line in your work. You talk about in the hands of the economist. The more precise the number, the bigger the lie. Now, for, for me, for just an average guy, I would have thought that uh, that more people would have realized that when Bernanke was out in 05 and 06 saying there was no real estate bubble, no, no, no possibility of that, but then the same guy was the savior in 08 and 09 and on the magazine, of, uh, you know, on the cover of Time magazine, you would think that more people would have like said, huh, something seems a little funny here, but it just doesn't happen when it comes to economists. And they've got such a, a, a special stranglehold uh, in this central planning uh, utility. Why don't you talk about the, the, the more precise the number, the bigger the lie? Well, it's, uh, economics is not also not what you think it is. And in fact, it's not what economists think it is because the economics profession changed remarkably over the last, say, 50 years. And before, you know, the profession was created by people like Adam Smith and Adam Ferguson. And these people were not at all the people like today's economists. They, they thought of themselves as moral philosophers. In fact, they called themselves moral philosophers because they were just trying to figure out how it works. They were observing. And they were observing it, and Adam Ferguson said this very clearly, you know, they were observing it as though it were a hive of bees. You know, they weren't trying to tell the bees what to do. They were just trying to figure out how the thing worked. 
And then in the uh, this in the last century, in the twentieth century, the economists really got too big for their britches, and they started figuring. They started seeing that they could play a bigger role in things. They could they could start telling people not only how the economy did work, which they didn't know, but also how it should work and how they they could make it better. But guess what? How many how many of the last you know back in since the nineteen seven nineteen seventy there have been seven recessions. How many of those do you think economists predicted? Well, zero. Yeah, <laughs> not, exactly, not a single exactly. one. <laughs> not a single one. And meanwhile, guess did economists, and that of course includes the recession that happened after the crash in 2008. Even in early 2008, you know, markets were crashing, everything was going to hell in a handguard, and they did a poll of economists at, by the uh, federal uh, by the Federal Reserve did a poll, and they found that uh, none, not a single one, thought that we we're entering a recession. And these people just don't know anything, but they pretend to know everything, and that's why. And, and what happened back in the uh, 20th century was they started using numbers. Adam Smith didn't use numbers except to, uh, in the most basic way to say, well, if so and so many tons of uh, iron ore output coming out of Aberdeen or something like that. But but now they have these compound fictions that they use to describe and control and manipulate the economy. And one of those, of course, is the unemployment rate that we hear about all the time. And they say, well, unemployment is 5.7%. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean it's really 5.7%? Well, no, it means something, but it doesn't mean anything that's worth anything because the whole idea of it is not subject to math. You know, they act as if it's a precise number, 5.7%, but in fact, you could, you, you're walking down the street, a guy comes up to you, a bum, and the bum says, uh, can you give me a dollar? And you say, no, but I got a little work to do uh, behind the house. And, and he, he says, well, what kind of work? <laughs> you know, you have a discussion with him. Now, the first thing is, is that person unemployed? Well, if you can't answer that question, you certainly can't come up with a precise number for unemployed people because he is somewhere in there, or should be somewhere in there. But no, he, he's probably not in there anyway because they only include people who are unemployed fairly recently. And this probably guy's probably been unemployed forever. But anyway, so you say to the guy, okay, I just want you to move some boxes. And then he says, uh, oh, well, how much will you pay me for moving the boxes? And I say, I'll pay you $10. And he says, uh, no, I'll do it for 15 And you say, no, that's too much money. And he says, okay, that's it. never mind. All right, now, what about this guy? Is he unemployed or employed? <laughs> well, he's unemployed, but he could be employed. It's, it's just not a... It's not subject to the kind of uh, scientific uh, analysis. It's, it's subject to a human analysis. We got every decision about being employed or not employed is subject to a whole range of questions. You know, and uh, a person a person doesn't want to cross the street, doesn't want to cross town, doesn't want to go to the next city to get a job. Is that person unemployed? Is it is that person unemployable? Or where does where does that person fit in? I mean, you have. You, a, a single a person himself doesn't know whether he's whether he can get a job or not because it all depends on the circumstances. Anyway, the po only point I'm making is that these numbers that they use are all fictions and they're all compound fictions. And the GDP growth rate, for example, that we rely on to say whether the economy is expanding, it's absolute fiction. I mean, it's just made up a, a number, made up of a lot of things with a lot of economists working on it, but it doesn't tell you whether anybody's getting better off or worse off. Not at all. That would depend on, that's a value judgment about whether things are getting better or not. And economists realized long ago that they can only add and subtract quantity. They can't have anything to do with quality. And quality is the way we measure our lives. Quality is what really counts. I used an example in that book, by the way, which I thought was pretty funny. Because the New York Times had an article about a guy. He was an immigrant to America, lived in Chicago, drove a taxi cab at the age of 55, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So, oh, well, I'm going to go back to Greece. He was from Greece. He said, I'm going back to my Greek island home, and I'm going to die there. All right, so he goes to, uh, to Greece, and he gets to his Greek island home, and there, you know, he, uh, 
He, he doesn't die. <laughs> he starts a garden. He starts raising his vegetables, and then he's out in the sun all day. And I don't know why he, he didn't, but he, was, he started living a very healthy way, I guess. And he didn't die. You know, he, he lived for another almost 50 years. Cause he, he, uh, not 50, about 40 years, because he died just a couple of years ago in his 90s. You know, you think about that as a GDP thing. That island, he was from Icaria in, in Greece, that island had no employment. He, going there, raising his garden, he moved into his parents' home, he did nothing. Zero. Zero for GDP, because he didn't get a job. He didn't die. If he died, they would have called the mortician, the mortician would have made some money, would have called the coffin maker, the coffin maker would have made some money, would have called the grave digger, the grave digger would have made some money, it would have been a boost for the whole economy. But he didn't die, and he didn't go to the doctor. He didn't even pay the doctor. He didn't pay the hospital. He didn't pay the insurance. He didn't do any of that stuff. He went to his parents' home, didn't build a house, didn't didn't renovate a house, no GDP increase at all, raised his own vegetables, and lived for 40 years. And the New York Times article said, and until he was in his 90s, he would go out at night and they'd go dancing at a local pub. <laughs> but here's the point. GDP did not go up. It went down because of this guy. If he died in America, he would have bought a casket, but he didn't die. He, he lived. This guy is not worse off. He's better off. The GDP did not measure anything worth measuring. And if you look at it in a broad sense, that's true everywhere. It measures how fast people go into debt. But it doesn't measure whether people are really getting any better off. The book is a great read. We're, we're just skimming the surface. You do a very deep dive. Uh, it's Hormageddon, How Too Much of a Good Thing Leads to Disaster. And I think one thing the audience should keep in mind with this conversation is that in modern society, right now times, when you have the NERP, as we talked about earlier, we have the ever-increasing debt, we have the ever-increasing power of the central planners, the growth of government, there is ultimately an end point. And, and you, uh, you, I, nobody can really predict when or how it will all unfold. But when you piece these things together, as you've done so eloquently in your work, we know it will happen. We just don't know exactly when. But, you know, any thinking person that goes through Hormageddon knows that this is all true. You just can't time it exactly, can you? No, and that's the thing. The longer it takes to arrive, the more people think it never will. And then when it does, the more people who are shocked, puzzled, and deeply devastated. <laughs> the book is Hormageddon, How Too Much of a Good Thing Leads to Disaster. Bill, is there a best website we can send people to? Bonnerandpartners.com. Okay, great. Bill, I appreciate you talking today. Thank you. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.